Strange Wills. Stories of strange wills made by strange people, starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, and featuring Lorene Tuttle, Perry Ward, with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast, and the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Envy, hate, jealousy, anger, despair, pride, and revenge. And here is our distinguished star of radio, stage, and screen, Warren William. These are stories of strange and unusual wills. Wills which to some are harbingers of good fortune, while to others messengers of misery. Nor are any of us safe from the evil and diabolical plans of men and women, who, frustrated in life, seek the bitter fruits of revenge in death, so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons living or dead. Time, names, and locale have been changed. Only the evil intent of the dead, departed, remains. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, let's hear a word from your announcer. Here is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in One Shining Hour. If Lucretia Borgia earned the dubious honor of being the mad killer of Italy, I wonder what history will call her direct descendant, Professor Don Borgia. That he was brilliant is attested, too, by his degrees from universities and colleges the world over and from the many books he had published at the turn of the century. That he was evil is also a matter of record. For Professor Don Borgia was expelled from Europe, his name stricken from the councils of all reputable institutions, and he, finding himself an outcast, took his young daughter and came to America. I'd heard only rumors of why he had fallen from grace. He had been accused of many things, the practice of medieval sorcery, witchcraft, and experimentation with the human mind, just as questionable vivisectionists do with dumb animals. When I received a written invitation to visit him at his isolated estate. I lost no time in accepting. I too was anxious to meet this reputedly evil genius. Even as I turned off the main highway and entered upon the long winding narrow road, I sensed that something extraordinary lay ahead. But I had never expected to find what I did. As I approached the house, I saw a little girl kneeling over a puppy. She was engaged in the dubious pastime of pulling small tufts of hair from its body. You're hurting the dog, little lady. She stopped and looked up at me. I saw that she had beautiful blue eyes, golden yellow curls cascaded down around her shoulders. She had the face of an angel. I walked up to her. What's your name? Nina. Don't you realize that you were hurting your puppy? He's mine, isn't he? Yes, that's true. But nice little girls don't torment poor little puppies, you know. What makes you think I'm nice? <laughs> well, aren't you? <laughs> I heard lots of things. I don't believe it. Well, I do. I pull legs off of grasshoppers. I tear the wings from butterflies. Oh. You are Mr. O'Connell? Yes, I am. And you are Professor Borgia, I presume? Yes, I am Professor Borgia. Uh, come in, please. 
Nina, you must leave that dog alone. The noise is distracting me. Yes, Papa. And Nina. Yes, Papa. You can learn nothing from plucking the hair from a dog. I was just trying to see what he looked like with his clothes off, Papa. I know that I shall not live to complete my greatest experiment, Mr. O'Connell. That is why I sent for you. No, I don't suppose that I, as a lawyer, can be of much scientific assistance. You're wrong. What I ask you to do will be simple. It's this. I want to make my last will and testament, setting up a trust estate for my... my daughter, Nina. Uh She is now six years old. I want you to supervise her education. She must attend the finest schools, both here and abroad. She must have the full benefit of this so-called modern-day culture. When she reaches her 19th birthday, you shall open this envelope. In it is her history. You shall then learn the nature of my experiment. Well, Professor, what you ask is a little beyond the scope of a probate lawyer's work. You shall be well remunerated for your trouble, Mr. O'Connell. You see, what you are doing, what you will see, has been eagerly sought for by the scientific world for over a hundred years. But they've all been afraid. Cowards. I will revenge myself against these stupid fools. And when Nina reaches her 19th birthday, what am I to do, Professor? Give her the contents of this envelope? I cannot answer that. Only you and time can answer that question. After the death of Professor Borgia the following year, I enrolled Nina in a very exclusive girls' school. Her curriculum had been scientifically worked out by the professor before his death. I thought my only task was to pay her school tuition and provide her with money under the terms of the trust. But when Nina was nine, I was summoned to the office of the principal, Miss Hargrove. Mr. O'Connell, I waited as long as I could before notifying you, but it was mandatory that you come. Why, yes, Miss Hargrove, of course. Is there something wrong? Quite frankly, I don't know. I... I can't understand. Suppose you tell me what's on your mind, Miss Hargrove. Nina is the most brilliant girl that's ever been in this school. We all agree that she is a young genius. When she reaches ten next year, she's ready for preparatory school. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more that we can teach her. Well, then I should feel elated. In one way, yes. In another way, decidedly no. This girl has two natures. One good, one very, very evil. Probably a split personality... She... Well, I hate to tell you this, Mr. O'Connell, but I feel it my duty. Of course, Miss Hargrove. She has the face of an angel and the heart of a devil. But I don't Let understand. me go on. At first, we thought we were mistaken, that no girl so beautiful, so amazingly brilliant. But we had proof, Mr. O'Connell, proof. Proof of what, Miss Hargrove? That this girl is a little fiend. She's cruel, sadistic. Wit started out in little things... First, we found the dead canary, its heart pierced with a needle. Then Miss Saxton found her Persian kitten drowned in the bathtub. We thought them all accidents until one night last week. Carol Ann, a student, to... Who's there? You're so beautiful, Carol Ann. So beautiful. But I must be most beautiful. There can only be one. One. Ah! With her fingernails, Nina had raked her face from temple to chin. Fortunately, the scars won't be permanent. Are you certain it was Nina? Carol Ann swears she saw her face in the light of the moon. Mm. That it looked like the face of, well, an angel. The girls are frightened out of their wits. And Nina? She denies everything. She blames it on the cat. Oh, it's preposterous. Miss Hargrove, Nina graduates in less than a month. I ask most sincerely that she be allowed to graduate with her class. I shall have a talk with her, and I am positive that no more will happen during that time. Take my word for it. Nothing will happen. Nina's next four years in preparatory school were marred only by one extraordinary incident. She told me that one moonlight night near the end of her senior term... Can you bring my horse, please? I'm going for a ride on the cliff. Right, miss. 
Well, do you think it's quite Do safe? as you're told. Whether it's safe or unsafe is my own private matter. Yes, Miss Borisha. Uh, I'll have him out in a moment. You needn't stay up. I'll unsaddle him when I return. Thank you, Miss. Easy, boy. I'll give you free rein when we reach the cliffs. Here we are, boy. Now take your head. Faster! Faster, boy! Faster! That's it! Fly like the wind! Don't stop! Don't stop! the horse could have fallen off the cliff quite accidentally, and Nina could have slipped off just before the fatal plunge. But was it an accident? I wasn't too sure. On the eve of her 19th birthday, Nina returned to the States from a triumphal stay in Europe. She had already received two degrees, one in Switzerland and one from the University of Paris. I met her at the airport. It was an exciting moment. And then I saw her. Good heavens, this couldn't be Nina. As lovely and beautiful a creature as I'd ever seen in my life. She looked like an angel. She was a symphony in blue. Nina? Nina! Here I am! Over here! Oh, John! John! Or is it still Mr. O'Connor? <laughs> well, now that you've grown up, it's John, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you again, John. Four long years. Four years of work, work and more work. But it hasn't hurt you any, even I can see that. Oh, thank you, kind sir. I haven't minded it, not at all. This summer I'm going to play, and then in October I'm going to Munich. Munich? Good heavens. <laughs> What's the attraction there? There's a Dr. Gooden there, one of the greatest minds of all times. His experiments in psychiatry are the talk of Europe. Oh, but I haven't told you, John. I'm specializing in rather a weird subject. It's called psychology of fear. Hmm, sounds rather ominous. But horribly amusing. It encompasses the monstrous morbidities of witchcraft and black magic. Hmm. Before I return to Europe in the fall, I hope to have had the opportunity of practical demonstration. And who will be the um, subject matter of these experiments, Nina? Men. Handsome young men that I shall bring into the flame of my orbit. Like the moth and the candle flame. Remember? Part two of Strange Wills will continue in just a moment. Now back to Warren William in part two of One Shining Hour. On Nina's birthday, I went to the bank vault and withdrew the large envelope which I had deposited some 12 years previously. When I reached home, I opened the envelope and saw that it contained two phonograph records. Evidently, I was to play them. I started the first record. I've had these records especially made for this occasion in order that you can listen to Nina's background 
as I would tell you in my own words. I was barred from teaching in European universities because I dared to advance the theory that the evils of man are bred into his offspring. How was I to prove to the world that I was right? Only through a living, breathing example, through my own child. In my blood runs the notorious strain of the Borgia family. We were the master killers of Italy. I needed a wife whose blood was equally as bad. Who then should I choose to bear my offspring? After months of endless search that took me the width and breadth of Europe, I met her in England. She was in jail. But what do you want with a woman like me, Professor? I got a record as long as my arm. Attempted murder, assault with a deadly weapon, drunk, disorderly. Goes on and on and How on How old and on. are you, Lottie? I'm 29. Oh, I know I look 40, but that's from the way I've lived. I've been a wild one, bad clean through. And your mother, Lottie? Died four years ago in the Archmouth prison. She was a four-termer. And your father? Hanged for murder. He knived a bloke for two shillings and threw the corpse in the Thames. You know, Professor, my father didn't have blood in his veins. No, sir, he didn't. It was ice water. That's the kind of a killer he was, too cold as ice. Lottie, you are just what I've been looking for. I'm going to make restitution for your crime and take you away. Take me away? Where are you going to take me, Professor? I'm going to take you to Italy, Lottie. You see, I'm going to marry you. I married Lottie the next month. Two years later, our child was born. I called her Nina. She was to be the greatest experiment of my life. Through her, I would prove to medical science, to the world... <laughs> oh, for Nina. I came in quietly to surprise you. Oh, John, what have I done to deserve this? How could he? How could he? Nina, dear, come over here and sit down. <laughs> well, there isn't much I can say. You heard, of course. Yes, I heard. And I know the answer to many other things. Oh, what's the use of going on? John, I want to thank you for everything you've done. You've been the one shining hour of my life. Put your head right here on Monday's shoulder, Nina. <laughs> I've always reserved it just for you. There's nothing I've seen that we can't lick. Nina, you ought to know that. But I can never have any more self-assurance. How could I possibly marry and have children? And why not? Are you going to let a couple of dead people ruin your life? Will you help me, John? Oh, haven't I always? What are we going to do? I'm going to prove to you that truth is stronger than fear. We think that your mother was criminally inclined. You fear your blood is contaminated because of her criminal tendencies. Well, there's only one way to find out. Anina, you and I are going to fly to England tomorrow morning. We've got to know why your mother led the life she did. And when we've learned that, then, my dear, we'll know what to do about you. <laughs> In England, my worst fears were confirmed. Nina's mother was even worse than the record had stated. Not only she, but her ancestors for three generations had prison records or been in trouble with the authorities. But was this succession of crime in one family hereditary? If that was true, Professor Borgia was winning his point. What chance had Nina? I shuddered to think of the consequences. That night... Mr. Counselor, now that you've examined the records, just what is your verdict? My verdict is still the same, that nothing your mother has done has any direct influence or bearing on what your future life, Nina. You know, John, there's one thing you overlooked today. Oh? Another sentence for murder, I suppose? No, not that one. One murder more or less couldn't possibly hurt me anymore. It was this. Do you remember the picture the warden showed us of my mother? Yes, I remember seeing it. I turned it over. On the back was a general description. I remember every word. Hair, black. Eyes, dark brown. Complexion, swarthy. What are you driving at, Nina? And my father. You remember him, too, don't you? His eyes were coal black. His hair was as black as a raven's, and he was swarthy, too, as most Italians are. Do you remember? Yes, Nina, that's right. Now look at me, John. What do you see? I see eyes as blue as a summer cloud. Hair as golden as a host of daffodils. Why... Why, Nina, now I see what you're driving at. But our answer isn't here in England. No, John, it isn't. We must go to Naples, where I was born. I know it's only a straw in the wind. At least we'll finally know the truth. And truth is the key, the real key to happiness for you, Nina. 
no matter how much it hurts. We flew to Naples the next afternoon. We learned that Nina's birth had taken place in St. Raphael's Hospital. Early next morning, Nina and I presented ourselves to the Mother Superior. Our records show that on the morning on May 21st at 1 a.m. in the year 1916, a baby girl was born to a Lottie Borgia. I personally remember this date because it was the night the hospital was bombed. A horrible night. How did the hospital happen to be bombed, sister? A huge zeppelin came over the city and attempted to bomb the rail terminal. It was shortly before one o'clock. I was on duty in division. Sister, be silent. Shall we attempt to take the babies to the shelter? We may have time. We won't have time, Maria. The zeppelin's almost overhead. But have no worries. The hospital's plainly marked, and our lights are on. They will see that this is a place of God. I hope you are right, sister. But the Germans are strange people. Sister, do you hear? If you're frightened, pray, Maria. The hospital! They have hit the hospital! Run, Maria. Call the sisters. Call everyone. We must save the babies. We must save the babies. We carried our surviving patients and children to the convent. It must have been a horrible and tragic experience. God's ways are strange, Mr. O'Connell. Strange. Now then, what else can I show you? I would very much appreciate seeing a roster of patients you had in the hospital on the night of the bombing. Yes, May 21st, 1916. May 21st. Oh, yes, here it is. Thank you, sister. Angela, Amati, Bonini, Borgia. Yes, Borgia, here it is. Lottie Borgia, wife of Don Borgia, age 31, gave birth to a baby girl, 12.21 a.m. You must know, Mr. O'Connell, that Mrs. Borgia was one of the victims of the air raid. Her baby survived. Yes, sister, I know. And that about brings us to the end of our trail. I can think of nothing more. I'm sorry, sir, that I, I can't see... Sister, could I see that roster for a moment? Why, yes, of course, my child. Thank you. We've always prided ourselves on the modern way... Sister? Sister? Yes, my child. I see that you have here another English woman, a lady Elizabeth Tudor. Could you tell me about her, please? Let me see the name, please. Lady Elizabeth Tudor. Oh, yes. Yes, she was the wife of one of the members of the British Diplomatic Corps. Both she and her baby daughter were found dead under the debris. Their bodies were returned to England for burial. The records show her baby was born just about the time Mrs. Borgia gave birth to her child. Yes, I remember now, too, that both of the newly born were lying in the same nursery when the bomb struck. The one lived, the other died. It was God's will. Sister, were foot impressions or fingerprints kept on all the children? Oh, yes, yes, immediately after delivery, a foot impression is made of each new arrival. And those records? Yes, they're kept here in the office. May we see those, sister? Both those of Mrs. Borgia's baby and those of Lady Tudor's baby. Certainly. Just a moment, please. Here they are. Baby Borgia and baby Tudor. Nina, I want you to take off your right shoe and stocking, please. Yes, John. Now, sister, if you will give me a pad of impression ink. Yes, certainly, Mr. O'Connell. Now, Nina, step on this pad firmly. There. That's it. Now put your foot on this paper. Put your whole weight down on your right foot. There, we've got it. Could I borrow your magnifying glass, sister? Yes, of course. Thank you. Ridges irregular. Yes, and here's a delta formation that corresponds exactly. The core of the pattern is identical. Come here, sister, please. Can you follow the ridges? Do you see this delta formation? Yes, yes, it's quite obvious. Now let's take a look at the Baba Borgia imprint. What do you see? What? There is no delta formation. That's right. Now, here we have the imprint of baby Tudor. Mother in heaven. This girl. This girl. Yes, sister. Nina is baby Tudor. As the mother superior said, Nina, God's ways are inscrutable. In one stroke of the brush, the truth has chased fear back into the slimy cave of ignorance. And now, in the 20th year of your life, you're going home. 
to your own beloved England. And you're going back a fine, beautiful, and lovely young lady. Yes, John. And all because of you. My one shining hour. I don't know how to thank you. Don't you suppose I'm just as happy as you are, Nina, dear? You see, I've almost been your father and mother all these years. You've grown right into my heart. Oh, John. You were a part of mine. Stay there always, John, won't you? Always and forever. Warren Whitney will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story of One Shining Hour. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. And here again is Warren William. This story has a happy ending. Nina is now Lady Moffat. Her home in the suburbs of London is the mecca of intelligent men and women come to worship at the throne of her genius. Of course, I attended the christening of her firstborn, and if my chest expanded an inch or two, well, <laughs> I had just cause. His name is John Francis Moffat. Like his mother... He had laughing blue eyes and golden hair. I had one more problem that I wanted answered before I closed the books on the probate cause of one shining hour. In Maryland, I located a childhood schoolmate of Nina's. It was the little girl who had once accused Nina of scratching her face. Upon her own admission, she confessed it was the cat. But she, in a fit of childish jealousy, had named an innocent girl... She also admitted killing the bird and drowning the Persian kitten, the prank of a spoiled child. And that brings us up to the last unexplained chapter in the book. As Nina's horse plunged over the cliff, Nina did laugh. But psychiatrists tell me that laughter can be an emotional outburst caused by hysteria. Well, knowing Nina as I do now, that's the answer. The professor wanted revenge but he should have known that revenge rests in a higher court. But what if Nina had actually been the daughter of the mad professor and the criminal Lottie? What would have happened? The thoughts are terrifying. Let's close the book before our imaginations run riot. Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a last will and testament that brought a murderer to bay. Its locale is the fog-swept moors of Scotland, a lonely castle that people shun in the belief that it is haunted. But within the doors of this mysterious castle, a drama is taking place. There is a casket, a body, and the sound of a weeping girl, and fog, eerie waves of fog. Listen next week to the story we call... Midnight on the Moor. This is Warren William, hoping that you will be with us again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Teleways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs>